Hello and welcome to the Stonebridge Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Goodman. I'm the publisher of Stonebridge Press and Stonebridge Press is located at www.stonebridge.com. We've been publishing books for oh, over 30 years now, mostly on uh, Japan with a couple books on China and a couple stray things thrown in for good measure. I'm here with Michael Palmer. Michael lives in Brooklyn, New York. He does publicity for Stonebridge Press and he's been with us for a number of years. He's also manning the audio and doing a lot of the stuff behind the scenes. Our special guest today is Eve Kushner. And Eve is a Stonebridge author. She's one of the few people to attain that exalted rank. Eve published a book with us a number of years ago called Crazy for Kanji. And that basically comes from her her love of kanji. She, I asked her for a brief description of herself, and this is what she said. It's very brief, so I'll just read it verbatim. Eve Kushner is a writer in Berkeley with a passion for kanji so deep that it has taken over her life. In 2010, she launched the project Joy O Kanji, in which she is writing one in-depth essay about each of the 2,136 characters required for literacy in Japan. She plans to do this until she dies or loses her mind. So, hi, Eve. Hi. Hi. Uh, while you are still alive and still sane, I'm glad we have, <laughs> Questionable. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad we have a chance to, to talk to you. And it's for, for someone who's listening to this and wants to explore right away, you can go to www.joyokanji.com, which is J-O-Y-O-K-A-N-J-I.com. And um, I did not realize that that was a play on words until... Uh, <laughs> No, it's, it's really, I did not, I I didn't get it. I'm really uh, embarrassed to say, it's like, when I read it, I was like, oh, of course. So uh, for those listening, uh, what what is the, uh, what's the joke here? Why yeah. Joy O Kanji, right? Okay, well, first Joy, J-O-Y, we all understand. And of course, Kanji, fill me with the greatest joy. So there's that. So Joy O Kanji, like Joy of Kanji. But of course, the word that, is more relevant to learners of kanji is J-O-Y-O, Joyo, which represents the set that you have to know for literacy, the 2,136 characters you mentioned in the introduction. It um, breaks down as ordinary use kanji. Right. So, so the Japanese word is Joyo, which means uh, ordinary use. And those are the, all the kanji that poor Japanese kids in schools have to learn from like day one, right? Right, but they're not poor because kanji are so wonderful. That's right. Kanji yeah. kanji makes you rich. <laughs> the more kanji you have, the more kanji you've memorized, the richer you are. That's it. So uh, now you grew up in the on the East Coast. What, right. where? In, in New York or? Oh, no. Um, no, I grew up in Annapolis, Maryland. Oh, born. Okay. So now, what does a a girl growing up in Annapolis, Maryland, what why the interest in kanji? Was it, was it did this start from a very young age? Well, it's interesting you pinpointed the coastal thing because no, there's no you know the whole you're from the East Coast, you know, and everything is oriented toward Europe to the degree that it's not just oriented toward America, which of right. course most of America is. So my introduction to Japan came when I was 13 and my family traveled to China, which had just opened up to tourism. And we broke up the long flight by stopping in Japan for four days. And I was enthralled with everything in Japan. I have to say I was 13. So the most interesting thing was the mini bar in the hotel which it, the second you pulled something out of it, it would charge you for it. And I just thought that was fascinating. <laughs> so, nothing deeper ethereal. It was a mini bar that got me. <laughs> really? Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I was in college still on the East Coast, and I took a course in Japanese and Chinese literature in translation. And again, I was really drawn to the Japanese material but it still wasn't a part of my life. And then I moved to California when I was 22 and everything started to change there because the Japanese and Chinese aesthetics are all around us. It, it may not be immediately apparent on day one, but for instance, in the hills where I live, there are streets that look more Japanese 
than any Japanese streets do in Japan. I've, I've been told that. And um, the aesthetic is all around us. And especially if you go to Chinatown, Japantown, start seeing the kanji everywhere. And I became more and more interested. And then I became a freelance writer, but I had nothing in particular to write about. So that was a problem I needed to solve. Um, meanwhile, I started studying foreign languages and I was forced to study three languages all at once when I was a child, um, French for 13 years, Hebrew and Latin. It didn't seem strange that I was taking three at once. Now it would, but I hated it. I didn't know the point of it. I wasn't going to be a translator. I wasn't particularly good at it. So it was kind of the bane of my existence. But then as an adult, I realized if you choose things that you do, you might actually enjoy them. And so I started studying Spanish. And this actually came from going to a reading at Black Oak Books by Rita Mae Brown. Uh -huh. And someone asked her, what advice would you give to an aspiring writer? And she said, learn as many languages as you can because you're going to start to make connections between the roots of those foreign words and the roots of English words, and you'll start to get a grasp on English. And she said something like, light bulbs will go off. I, she had this image of an electronic board with bulbs. Somehow that's what I came away with. Or that's what I've remembered. One after the other will go off. And that is exactly what it's been like. So language study has become the passion of my adult life. And I'm currently trying to regain all the French I once knew. But Anyway, I started with Japanese, and then I was writing about Japan for Japanophile, as you may remember, I wrote about you. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't know any Japanese, and a mutual acquaintance of ours, Robert Ozaki, told me, uh -huh. uh, if you're going to write about Japan, you have to learn the language. And I thought that was impossible. Everybody knows it's impossible, and I resisted it for a while, but... I became depressed about something and I realized language study is always the thing that pulls me out of depression for some weird reason as an adult again, because, you know, it fills you with a sense of the possibilities and, and the thrill, the discoveries inherent in all these words. And um, so I started studying Japanese and it was in the third course that we started with kanji and I didn't love it at first. It didn't make any sense to me. Things we had been able to use hiragana, the phonetic script up till then, and then katakana. And I thought, well, that covers every word. Why do you need this third script? And nobody explained it to me because that's not how Japanese is taught. Yeah, You're just told to memorize. Yeah, there's no good, no good reason. Like, yeah. yeah. So, and then all the rules behind it, I couldn't make heads or tails of why we pronunciations would change depending on the context. In a significant way, she would say, this is the Japanese pronunciation and this is the Chinese pronunciation. That didn't clear up anything at all for me. So I started to look for answers on my own using one of the books you published, Michael Rowley's Kanji Pictographics, uh -huh. using Spahn and Hadamitsky's wonderful Kanji Dictionary. And I right, right. found words that don't exist in English. I mean, for which we don't have English equivalents, words that would make me laugh out loud because they were so charming, like... Um, one of my favorites is something actually Japanese people have never heard, but uh, learning to swim on a tatami mat. That's what, um, <laughs> for instance, studying kanji outside of Japan is like the way I do it, you know, from books. So it just led me into this wonderful world and I've never left that world. So, I, I mean, there are a lot of people who, uh, uh, you know, appreciate Japan for its, its aesthetic quality, its uh, civilization, long history. Uh, there may many different ways of getting into Japan. Language seems to be the way for you, but I can't think of anyone who has actually jumped into the world of kanji as, uh, I, I don't mean to say, I don't use the word obsessive in a bad sense, but <laughs> it sounded to me like you were very unhappy when you were in a situation where you didn't understand something, and so you were going to go and you were going to try and make sense of it. And the problem of trying to make sense of kanji is that, as we know, there's over 2,000 of them. Each one of them has a different history, and it could be that the history has no particular logic to it. It just it just kind of happened. You know, there's yeah. a lot of happenstance involved in how some of the characters and their usage developed. How much more comfortable are you? Do you feel like you're achieving the level of understanding you were, you were hoping for? You still feel like there's a long ways to go. That's an interesting question, and both are true. I'm considerably more comfortable with the concept of it, with the how, the architecture of a character, the structure of 
a sentence, although grammar isn't my strong point. But what I created with this book that I wrote for your house is a map to the world of kanji. And it definitely succeeded in orienting me and giving me the comfort that wasn't there with the teacher not explaining anything. But on the other hand, the world of kanji is vast. And I know that I will never begin to master it. It's impossible. I don't really think anybody can master it, but the Japanese native speakers, of course, can do wonderful things. And it seems to me whenever I'm learning a language that the native speakers are geniuses. You know, they can just look at a sign and absorb it all in a second. Uh, look at a text on, on a, a page of Japanese and absorb it in a minute. And yeah, it does seem a bit unfair. You know, <laughs> they, they can just look at it and get it right away and don't have to struggle with it. <laughs> of course, I mean, that, that brings up something else I wanted to ask you about, because I think most Japanese people, like you say, they just they just get it, right? They don't think about it because it's, I mean, it's their language. It's just right. no no big deal. I mean, they, they don't look at a kanji and see, uh, you know, hundreds of years of Chinese history and evolution and all the same, and in the same way that we don't look at our English alphabet and look back at, you know, Phoenician or cuneiform and try and figure out where these particular symbols came from. They just are, and they serve a very, very practical purpose. So... I would say that there are very, very few Japanese who understand, and may I put understanding in, in quotes a little bit, who sort of look at kanji in the, in the way that, that you do. When you, when you talk to, to Japanese people who are not linguists or language teachers and you explain your fascination, what kind of response do you get from them? Well, as you said at the beginning, it's the bane of their existence sometimes that they were forced to learn this thing. They went to cram school, so they would go through a full day of school and then go to a second school at night so that they could pass the exams to get into school. So it was torture at some level, and at some level, it's mundane for them. It They stopped seeing the wonder in it, if they ever saw it. I don't think most of them saw it. And on the other hand, I was rereading my book for this interview, and remembered a phrase that you gave me, which was that kanji are the soul of Japan. And I said that? You did. <laughs> <laughs> really? I think it was you. I can't think who else, and I can kind of hear you saying it. And, um, <laughs> and it does seem to be a great source of national pride, and they are charmed by their own language, as they should be. And sometimes it's not necessarily just about the kanji. It might be about idiomatic phrases. I think they get a big kick out of that. One that comes to mind is, if the ATM isn't working, I'll come back later when the ATM is in a better mood. Uh -huh. Somebody right. got me in that one with, with a kind of twinkle in his eye. And you get a lot of that. They, they seem to have a playfulness with it. And it's a playfulness I can't ever replicate. You know, they're just so far beyond me. But I can appreciate it passively when I understand. Yeah. Uh, I, what do you know about how, how kids in Japan are taught kanji how do they learn it is it strictly repetition memorization writing 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 yeah they are um, among other things told to write the same kanji a hundred times or whatever it is which to me always reminds me of how in the states at least in the past when somebody misbehaved in a classroom they were told to go to the blackboard and write i will not misbehave a hundred times it seems like punishment and they are taught, I suppose, the readings, the Japanese and Chinese pronunciations. But again, because they already have the vocabulary, they can plug that into what they know. Oh, sure, I know this flower is pronounced this way when we speak of a flower, but if it's part of the word for vase, then we change the pronunciation. They, they have the whole context set up. I don't know that much about it. Yeah, that's that's not how you that's not how you learned. No. Now, would you say that uh, of of the over two thousand uh, Joyo kanji? Uh, do you feel that you've can you can you look at them all and recognize them at this no. point? No, no, by no means. No, in fact, I'm embarrassed to say this, but sometimes I've written a whole essay about one, and then I see that kanji a while later, and I think I've never seen this kanji in my <laughs> life. <laughs> I'm quite shocked to realize I've written a 15 to 20 page essay about it. How did that uh, not stay? I, re I remember when I, when I was studying, um, I, I went to an intensive Japanese language class at uh, International Christian University. They were dumping 15 kanji on us a day. Wow. And every morning we would have a test. And the next day there'd be another 15 kanji. So we just had to keep 
memorize them. And so at the end of, I don't know, uh, six months, uh, you know, we would learned over a thousand kanji. And I put learn in scare quotes, of course. And I described it at the time as trying to wrap my hands around a whole bunch of frogs and keep them in my <laughs> arms. And one was always jumping out. And I'd reach for that one and put it in as I was reaching. Another one would jump out. I could never seem to just get the point where I could just feel comfortable knowing them. I mean, some of them are, are kind of obvious and easy, but others were, they just constantly gave, gave me a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Each one that comes into my head pushes another one out. Yeah, exactly. And maybe it's partly age, you know, maybe uh -huh. if I were 40 years younger learning this, it would have stuck. But that's the thing about what you just said. A lot of people learning kanji embrace the high sig method or some sort of flashcard method and if they uh, what's the high sig method high sig is an author who created this book that has a cultish following for reasons i don't entirely understand it'll make people combative if you say well i use a different method and they'll say no no high sig high sig high sig has to be high sig <laughs> i see i don't understand this fanatical devotion but it also is, i have his book and it teaches you the pronunciations of eat the kanji and how to draw it. Perhaps that's what people learn and they think they know it. But one analogy that comes to mind is if you've been to Vegas, this will make more sense. If you haven't, it won't. But if you look at one of the massive hotels from the sidewalk, say the Venetian hotel, you might think, yeah, oh, I've seen the Venetian. I know what the Venetian is all about. If you go inside, you realize you know nothing about it. You have to be inside to see the rich materials they use, the marble, all the ornate decoration, the extent to which they took this concept of Venice and ran with it. You have to see what it feels like to be along this canal with gondolas going up. You have to know, you have to walk, realize it might take a half hour at least to walk from one end of the building to the other. You can't comprehend how immense it is, how complicated, how you can get lost over and over. And that's what it feels like for each kanji. It's not enough to look at it from the sidewalk. You have to have this deep immersion and an appreciation of all of its complexity, all the ways in which it behaves differently from word to word to word. So you're saying each kanji is kind of a world unto itself. It is. It absolutely and, is. And just looking at it and saying, oh, that's yama or that's, right. that that's, that's not a, but I mean, when people are reading and writing, they're not really trying to express the meaning of the kanji, they're just using it to communicate with someone who recognized the kanji as having a particular sound or representing a particular concept. Yes, you're talking about a native speaker, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, though, there, as you know, it's a language of enormous nuance. And it's not just that, but this is important, that if they say the same word three times, Actually, it could mean something a little different each time they're expressing shades of irritation or, or different things. But there are many, many kanji to represent, say, to open. But you need to choose the right one to express exactly what you mean. So, for instance, the kanji I'm working on this week means to open up land, as in to develop a wilderness into a civilization, perhaps with nuances of colonizing but you're not really supposed to read it that way. But there's a much more common, rather mundane kanji for opening the door. Right. And you could read them the same way, and you can use them interchangeably in, these, in a certain word, but which one you choose will convey a great deal about your attitude, about the feeling of that word. The, the, the meaning is transmitted differently when it's written as opposed to when it's oral? Yeah, I think that's why so much is lost when it's spoken. That's what you um, need to read. I only, I prefer to read. <laughs> uh, well, that's interesting. You know, I, I remember working in a, I used to work for Charles Tuttle, and we did a book by a linguist named uh, Kindaichi. And right. he wrote, and he wrote, he was uh, discussing a lot about Japanese language. And there was a, f a famous novelist, I think, at the end of World War II, who suggested that Japan abandon kanji. And in fact, Japan abandoned Japanese, I think, and everybody speak French. <laughs> <laughs> would have made uh, your life a lot easier. <laughs> since you, would. Yeah, yeah. Consolidate uh, all the languages into one. <laughs> But you know what, can I go back and um, say something to amend what I said before? 
Although I said you have to write to convey nuance, that's actually completely stupid because obviously the Japanese know how to communicate perfectly well in their own language with each other and to communicate whatever nuance they need. So kanji is not the only way to accomplish that. Right, right. Yeah, uh, I, but, but kanji can provide an additional level of connotation or shade yeah, of meaning. Exactly, of nuance, exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you have you found a number of uh, people who are real advocates for what you're doing among your Japanese colleagues and supporters and and readers? Do they they kind of say, "Oh, well, a Japanese person could never do this because you're looking at everything as an outsider and seeing it in a perhaps completely different way. You're making connections that they would never make." That's absolutely right. I work very closely with one man in particular. He's just an ingenious linguist, and he's fantastic in both Japanese and English, which is essential. And he has said that on numerous occasions that he really enjoys looking at his own language through my fresh eyes, because I see all these things he doesn't see. I ask questions that they would never ask about their own language. And they enjoy, I have a team of researchers, and they enjoy the process of looking up all sorts of things. And what I love about what I'm doing with Dura Kanji is each kanji is a portal into a different world. If you go back to the Venetian hotel example, each one is a hotel unto itself. And I'm writing an encyclopedia, essentially, as well as a dictionary. And I didn't know I was doing either of those things when I started this massive project, but I am. And so each kanji represents a concept that's linked to a massive amount of cultural, historical, linguistic information. And I need to get into all of it and then figure out what to present in an essay that's still palatable and entertaining. Yeah. So so how long does it take you roughly to go into one kanji? Well, I break it up into a lot of baby steps. Otherwise, it would be overwhelming. And each one is different. Some might have 15 keywords associated with it, you know, vocabulary words. And some might have hundreds or even thousands. And I'm avoiding those for now. I'm taking all the little ones right. for starters. And they still take maybe 30 hours per kanji. Wow. Maybe. And how many have you done so far of the over 2,000? What, what are you at now? 461 written. Oh. So have you done the actuarial calculations? Or? Yesterday, I calculated that that's 21.5% of the set that I'm trying to write about. Okay. And that's taken you how many years? 12, 12, but there was a whole lot of setup, a lot of effort into creating a website. Okay. Yes. Well, let's drop that down to eight. You, you're a, you have, uh, you have 32 years left by my calculations to, to finish everything. Is that, is that, is that about right? I don't know. Somehow every time I calculate it, I, I end up thinking I have to live to be 110 and to yeah. be really sharp still when I'm 100. <laughs> That's the thing that kind of makes me worried. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, what order are you proceeding? How do you how do you choose which one to do next? Okay, so they have divided it into two sets: the Japanese, in terms of elementary school kanji, and the ones learned after that, which are called the junior high school set. So I started with they the meeting the Japanese, the Japanese education educational history. system. Yeah. So I started with the latter set for a few reasons, and one is that there were far more in those that I didn't know. So they right. seem more interesting. Okay. There are far more in those that no one who's learning kanji will know because everybody starts with the easier set. There's a lot more to say about the more complicated ones in certain ways. I don't know. They seem to be associated with diseases. I've been writing about diseases a lot. And, and smallpox is a lot more fun than you might have guessed. I, I didn't know that. I always <laughs> thought it was really entertaining and fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good time with that essay. In 2010, right when I started this project, the Japanese government added another couple of hundred to the Joyo set. So I felt that I was doing a service actually by providing information about the new set. So I've been focusing a lot on those. It's kind of like a, a jigsaw puzzle too, where people do the frame first and then fill in the rest. And that's, of course, I suppose logical when you're doing a puzzle. I'm not sure why it's logical, but it is. But it also gives you a sense of relief. Okay, at least I've done the frame. And so I, I sort of feel that with the new set, it, when I get those 200 and so finished, at least I, I can say that that part's finished and, and nibbling away at the rest. It's, it's just amazing. I, I was looking at your site in, in preparation for this interview, and I'm just stunned and overwhelmed at the amount of incredible information you have there, not simply about individual kanji. And by the way, joyokanji.com 
go there and have a look at it. Um, you have separate PDF articles on over 400 kanji that are available now. Mm-hmm. People can subscribe and become a uh, like a lifetime member. Not a lifetime, it's an annual membership, but then they get access to everything. Or you can pick and choose and just get the individual PDF articles. But this is not a sales pitch for Eve's site. I mean, it sort of is. Go ahead. ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So everyone go and subscribe. It's fantastic. (laughs) But there's a lot of, lot more information there. If you have any interest in learning, learning kanji, there are all these resources, links to books, to websites. There's a whole bunch of free stuff there on, uh, uh, what what was the name of the, um, the guy that you're working with that did all the, uh, Ulrike, the mnemonics? Well, Rika is a woman. Oh, it's a woman. Oh, woman. Okay. She's from Austria. Oh, she's from Austria. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. And so, yeah, she writes all the mnemonics for the site. That's right. And yeah, that's a popular and, section. And she's she's got everything, right? No, but she's closing in on it by next summer. Oh, okay. All right. One of my favorite parts of the site and one of the most popular parts is the radical notes section. I don't know if you saw that. Yes. Each kanji has a part of it that's called the radical and it's how they classify, how the Japanese classify, and the Chinese, each kanji. It's it's an organizational system. And it just started out that in each essay, I wanted to indicate what the name of the radical is. That's all it was. And it became a little complicated to explain in the space allotted in a PDF. So I decided to create a separate sort of note system where I would just, you know, refer people. And then this site, just this part of the site took on a life of its own. And I am writing one essay about each radical as well, each radical that's used in a Joyo Kanji. So there are 214 radicals, but not all of them are used in Joyo Kanji. So I get to skip maybe 14 of those, but I'm still writing hundreds of radical notes, and that is free material. And uh, well, maybe you could explain uh, what what a what a radical is and and how it fits in with all the rest of the kanji. Well, I tried, but I stumbled. Let me try again. (laughs) Um, So a kanji is often constructed of several components that are combined. It's like a house and you have a kitchen and you have a bathroom and you have a bedroom and they all fit together. They each serve a function. So you could think of it like that. And some of the parts of a kanji will provide the sound and some parts provide meaning. The radical is the most likely to provide meaning. So it could be as simple as it means hand or tree or water. And so somebody a long time ago decided to organize this massive system of characters because it is inherently chaotic. So just as in a library where we used to have the Dewey Decimal System that people understood, or a bookstore, you know, you can go in and there's the section on architecture and there's the section on self-help. It's like that. So all the kanji with the tree radical are grouped under the tree radical. And do they do, do all the kanji with a tree radical necessarily have something to do with trees? They tend to. So a lot of stuff about wood and forest, uh-huh. uh, but they don't all. And that's the fun of it is, I mean, I think it's fun. Some people don't, but um, the shapes of these characters have changed over the millennia, sometimes intentionally through a process um, of simplification because they were really chaotically um, complex in the beginning and people couldn't handle them, or sometimes through miscopying, because for millennia before we had any kind of way of reproducing things mechanically through computers or printing presses, people had to copy kanji, and it was laborious, and they made mistakes, and a lot of kanji looked like each other. So this affected the etymology. A lot of mistakes were absorbed, like, okay, that was a mistake, but you know what? I like that mistake. Let's stick with that one. Mm. So things that looked like trees before but weren't quite trees may have become trees <laughs> in current characters and vice versa. Things that used to be trees may be stopped being. I'm not quite sure. But. Kanji came from China, were imported into Japan. Right. And there's a lot of kanji in China and Japan that are absolutely identical. They may have different pronunciations because the pronunciations are assigned to the particular characters, but the character form itself may be completely identical. But the uh, mainland Chinese, uh, anyway, they've simplified many of their their characters now so that there's been some divergence um, between Chinese and Japanese kanji. And similarly, I guess uh, Japanese have created a couple kanji of their own that do not exist in China. Yeah, that's a fun process. I mean, the 
the challenge of creating a kanji, but yeah, there's one from Mountain Pass. Yeah. Uh, there's, I think, um, I want to say 13 that they've created, but maybe that's wrong. Yeah, it's not, it's not, not a, a huge number, yeah. as, as, as I recall. Right. Yeah. Your goal with the uh, site, which I, which again, I want to urge people to go to because it's absolutely fantastic, uh, full amount of resources. Your goal is to to write one of these a month and to no, 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 uh, one a week. But you're writing one a week. Oh yeah, I write four. My current goal is four four kanji essays a month, one a week. Oh my! And gosh. four radical notes a month, plus one newsletter, which is a whole other undertaking. What else do you do? Uh, you may not know this, but there's not a lot of money in the kanji game. So I do need to earn money in other ways to support my kanji research because I have to pay all these people, including a graphic designer, blah, blah, blah. So I have a baking business. I just got an order this morning. So I have to do that. And I have a dog walking business. Oh, I you have a what kind of uh, are you a bread baker? Yeah, but that has kind of fallen by the wayside. I sold you a loaf a long time ago. You put it in the freezer and don't know if you ever tried it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll look in our freezer. So it's still there. But I, I'm pretty yeah. sure we uh, had it and enjoyed it. Okay. So anyway, um, my two main things are uh, they're both gluten free, but banana bread with chocolate chips and walnuts, and then a sour cream coffee cake with walnuts. Okay, well, uh, you're 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 in the oven uh, whipping up whipping up kanji. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, so if if you want to explore the wonderful world of uh, kanji, go to joyokanji.com on the internet. And like I say, there's a fantastic number of resources, and presumably there's a way for people to contact you there as well. Oh yes, yes. Yeah, crazy for kanji. The Stonebridge Press book is still available for sale. I was looking at it last night, going through it, and it wasn't that long ago. But the only thing I re I remember about doing it was put it together. In now, Eve provided all the text and all the concepts and everything, so we're not taking any credit for that. But putting the whole thing together and making all these pages and work as a matter of consistent design, I just remember that being a, an absolute torture. Every page. <laughs> Every page was different, and back then, not that long ago, but still, um, working with kanji was not not so easy. I was not like an, a super InDesign master at the time, so trying to figure out how to do things because there was there was images, there was kanji, there was lists, charts, arrows, sidebars, screen, all this stuff going on. It was really really complicated to put everything together. But at the end of the day, it's it looks like a fantastic book. If I do say so myself, <laughs> it's, it's really it's really amazing. There's just so much stuff on every page. If you have any interest in learning Japanese because you really want to take your manga reading to the next level, really you got to go out and get Crazy for Kanji, Eve's book, and you ought to check out joyokanji.com, which is Eve's amazing website um, uh, although you said you can't take any credit for what's in the book and that i provide all the text that's actually not true at all really you may remember you may not remember i came to you with an incredibly amorphous idea of what would be in this book and what's in this book now has no correlation whatsoever to my initial idea because you said okay that sounds good but don't do any of that instead write about kanji as they're used in china taiwan and korea and I was just stunned. How am I going to do that? But you had this vision and you knew where the potential lay and you were right. So I just followed every lead you told me. And oh, I see. Well, yeah, I'm, that's how it turned into what it is now. It's not at all what I planned to write. Oh, well, I, I don't want to <laughs> I see. Well, I, I apologize. You uh, scared the hell uh, out of me. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize I was creating so much work for myself. I mean, it's, no. it's really uh, kind of an amazing book. And, uh, I gotta say, you know, it's, I was looking at it, it's eight and a half by 11, over 200 pages. Every page is like stuffed with fabulous information. And it's only $19.95. <laughs> and that's $19.95, folks. And do you know, people still complain that it's too expensive. I, it's just astonishing to me. Well, it's not too expensive. It is a bargain. Hopefully people do that. And, uh, you know, you get a lot of Eve's other stuff uh, online as well. So uh, thank you. Uh, we've been talking with Eve Kushner. 
go to joyokanji.com and get started. You know, if you learn one kanji today and you do one a day at 2,000 kanji, that's like how many years? Six, seven years? You can you can master them all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed talking to you about this. Okay, thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.